Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us for our webinar. We already have 70 plus participants, which is very exciting. Um, if everyone's good to go, we're gonna go ahead and get started right on time. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the first of four webinars in a new series called Using Marine Shoreline Design Guidelines to Improve Shoreline Stabilization Permitting. This webinar is sponsored, uh, this whole series actually is being sponsored by the Shoreline and Coastal Planners Group, and it was developed by Washington Sea Grant, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Washington Department of Ecology. First, some technical logistics. We are doing our very best to um, disable participant microphones. So if you could first check if you're muted and um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. You can open the chat by clicking on the chat icon. Um, we also have some materials available for you to download that we're gonna reference during the webinar series and that you can also use for yourself following the series. These materials can be found um, in the reminder email for today's webinar and on the Shoreline and Coastal Planners Group website, which is shown here. Um, our materials include a glossary of terms. So if you hear any words you don't recognize, uh, check out our glossary. And also a note, uh, today's webinar is being recorded. Recordings of our webinars are going to be posted also on the Planners Group website. Today's webinar will serve as the introduction to the entire series and lay some foundational concepts for later webinars. Specifically, today's webinar will cover some basics of shoreline geology, processes, and biology, and also provide an overview of the shoreline permitting environment. We hope that you will join us for future webinars to build on the concepts that we cover today. Today, you're gonna to be hearing from three speakers. I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Sydney Fishman, and I'm the Shoreline Armoring Planning Associate at the Washington Department of Ecology. Now I'll let our other two speakers introduce themselves. Let's go first to Nicole. Hi, I'm Nicole Fagan with Washington Sea Grant Coastal Management Specialist. And I'm Corey Morse. I'm a environmental engineer with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Awesome, thanks everybody. So before we dive into the content, we want to introduce the series to you overall and provide some context for why we decided to create this series. The technical information for this presentation is based on the Marine Shoreline Design Guidelines, or MSDG, which is seen on the left of this slide. Uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, WDFW, published this document in 2014, and the guidelines were really meant for a technical or a designer audience. And in fact, folks around the region, like Corey and Nicole, my co-presenters, are working to promote the usage of MSDG with those technical audiences. On the right is a homeowner-focused resource that DFW published in 2016 called Your Marine Waterfront. So for local planners on this call, you might have copies of this document at your permitting counter. And this brochure is filled with pictures and graphics to translate some of those technical concepts from MSDG to shoreline homeowners. Um, also a note, we have a section on the Coastal Planners Group website dedicated to links. So you can find links to both of these documents and to other resources on that website, coastalplanners.org slash webinars. So given that we have this extensive technical document as well as homeowner resources, why did we develop this webinar series? The concept for this series is to take the MSDG resources, which are more technical, and make the concepts applicable to permit reviews. So for example, folks at local governments reviewing shoreline exemptions for bulkheads. We're breaking out the information in MSDG that's specific to planners and condensing it in a way that we hope you'll find relevant. The concepts of MSDG, as well as the MSDG-based tools that we're going to share throughout the series, can help you better understand the design elements of an application. And they can also help you assess whether an application satisfies your local permitting requirements. And as I mentioned earlier, today's webinar is going to cover the foundational concepts of beach geology, processes, and biology that shape our shoreline. And we're also gonna cover um, elements of the permitting environment that will influence project design and review. 
In next week's webinar, which will be on February 18th, we will discuss key elements of a site assessment and how that relates to a demonstration of need review under Shoreline Master Programs. Webinar three on February 25th will take a deeper dive into different shoreline treatments and erosion control techniques, and we'll provide an MSDG-based tool to help you assess the right technique for a site when reviewing a permit application. And our last webinar on March 3rd will consider shoreline stabilization in the context of sea level rise. We'll examine the latest sea level rise projections for Washington, examine what we know about the impacts to the shoreline, and discuss different response strategies, including soft shore. And if you're not already uh, registered for those later webinars, please visit our website and register for each one individually. And here's that link again, coastalplanners.org slash webinars. A little bit more setting the stage. As part of the Puget Sound Partnership's vital sign on shoreline armoring, DFW has been analyzing its permitting data to look at regional armoring trends. Using the hydraulic project approval or HPA data, we can look at permitted armor over the past decade and a half. This graph, which I'm sure many of you have seen already, shows the permitted length of shoreline armor on Puget Sound in miles. It looks at new armor, replacement armor, and armor removal. What's important to note is that we've seen a gradual decline in new installations of permitted armor, which is shown in the dark purple. And we also see a gradual increase in armor removals, which are shown in light purple below the y-axis. But what has been consistently the highest category of armor projects is replacements, shown in gray. We include this to set some context and to frame the discussions we'll present during the series. Um, as you all probably know, there are many drivers of these trends, but we hope to highlight a few. New armoring projects are down um, because of new regulations and also because we have a greater understanding of armor's impact to the nearshore environment. Removals are also increasing um, because of the attention paid to impacts and the funding that follows to do those projects. Bulkhead replacements are the most common project type and we expect that trend to continue, especially considering the aging stock of existing armor. So what do we hope that you'll learn and take away from this whole series? First, we hope that you'll find this series useful as you implement the shoreline stabilization elements of the SMPs. This series will address elements like demonstration of need and the analysis of soft shore alternatives and provide MSDG-based tools to assist in your review. Second, this series will give you a better understanding of soft shore projects, what they look like, where they're a viable option, and also tools to help you review soft shore feasibility analyses. Third, we hope that you'll see this series as a translation of the MSDG technical document into a language and set of tools that you can use in your planning and permit review roles. And we hope to give you some vocabulary to better read, discuss, and understand technical reports. Finally, this information will help you review many types of shoreline armoring projects. So not just new ones, but also replacement projects. And as we saw in the previous slide, replacements are a major project type on our shoreline. And as we'll discuss later today, um, ecology's rules require a demonstrated need for bulkhead replacements. So these tools can help you understand whether a replacement is needed and can be permitted at a site. Before we dive into our content for today, we do wanna take a pulse of our audience using a poll. So hopefully very shortly on your screen, um, there should be some questions popping up. So we'll give everyone um, a few seconds to answer these questions. And we have our technical folks watching the poll. So we'll just give everyone a few more seconds to answer these questions. Um, and then once we've gotten critical mass, we'll go ahead and put up the results and just briefly discuss them. <laughs> 
Awesome. So thanks everyone so much for responding. Looks like um, hopefully everyone else can see the poll results. We've got a really great mix of um, all sorts of um, different places of employment, um, a lot of planners on the call, but also a good mix of technical folks, resource managers, and other 14%. Curious what those folks do. And also looks like a pretty good geographic representation. Um, we're about 50-50 split. Well, a little bit more, 56% um, have not used MSDG, 44% have, and also a good range of familiarity with shoreline processes. So that's awesome. Thank you everyone for responding. This really helps us know our audience and tailor um, what we wanna share with you. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass the mic to Corey Morse from WDFW. All right, thank you, Sydney. Um, so we're going to discuss the basic concepts here, and uh, but first we're going to kind of run through the lens that we're viewing the shoreline in, uh, which is mostly Puget Sound for this discussion. Um, then we'll discuss kind of what's there, what's, uh, what are the critters there, what, um, some of the critters there, and why do we care much about them. And then we'll discuss, jump into a discussion on the physical processes that have, have formed our shorelines and that maintains the beaches that we see there today. So for today's talks and the webinars in the coming weeks, what do we mean when we say the shoreline? For the most part, the area we're going to be speaking about is, like I said, Puget Sound, the Puget Sound shoreline, and the concept we'll be discussing, they, they should apply relatively well to the open coast, but the processes there and on other, um, other coastlines are a little bit different. So, um, specifically where we're looking at. The shoreline is a pretty broad label, so for our purposes, we're gonna focus specifically um, on the areas above mean lower low water up to the areas that drain to and over the bluff. So, uh, or in the, the figure you see above there, we're gonna be focusing on the uh, section labeled near shore. It's got kind of that peachy brown bar on the bottom of the figure. So. Now that we know what we're talking about specifically, what do we, um, oh sorry, when we say the shoreline, um, let's clarify some terms real quick. <clears throat> Whenever we're referring to an elevation tidally, it should relate to the local tide range at a given site. So in Puget Sound, we've got a semi-diurnal tide, which means we get two full highs and lows per day. And uh, this, there's a lot of different ways that we can characterize the water levels on a given site. So the levels that, um, that I'm gonna reference here real quickly are, um, they're all averaged over a full lunar cycle, which is the primary driver of our tidal action, which is about 19 years. And so the, those, those benchmarks are the highest observed tide, which is just kind of like it sounds, the highest astronomical tide, which is the highest tide neglecting the effect of barometric pressure, mean higher high water, which is the average of the higher, of the daily high tides over that tidal epoch, um, the mean high water, which is the average of all the high tides, mean tide level or mean sea level, which is the average of all tide levels um, over that period, mean low water, which is the average of all the lows, mean lower low water, the average of the lowest of the daily lows, and then the lowest astronomical tide and the extreme low tide or the lowest observed tide. So uh, let's take a quick look at what we think of when we think of our shorelines and our beaches. Uh, and I apologize about the, the fuzzy mic. I've been having mic problems, so bear with me on this one. We'll, we'll see if we can get it worked out as we go. Thanks for the comments, though. Um, so generally, when we think of our Puget Sound beaches, we tend to think of something like what you see here, uh, gently sloping with glacial materials. Um, and the conditions are biologically important for many species. Historically, um, people wanted deep water access to the shore. So we would extend armor to deeper water that could ultimately impact the shore itself, um, both directly by just covering up habitat um, and uh, somewhat indirectly, which we'll kind of touch on as we go. So here's our beach, nice back beach um, on, on at least one of those there. Sometimes there's a bluff on the back beach, sometimes there's a house. These areas are great places to hang out in nice weather and great to see from your back door. Why are we concerned? Um, let's let's take a quick look at some of the fishes that we care about. So here we have some of the more typical inhabitants and the fishes that are reliant on the nearshore zones. Most commonly, it seems like you hear people talking a lot about sand lance and surf smelt. Uh, 
who both use the, the beach and the zones in the mid to upper tide range, not only to hang out and reside in, but for spawning. Um, so these areas are critical to the success of these critters. Um, these guys spawn a little bit differently than something like a Semonid, whose eggs stay underwater. Um, their eggs will actually sit on the beach above the tide level for a good period of time and rely on that healthy beach profile, wave action, and a broad range of particles for those uh, um, eggs to succeed. Uh, so on the left there, we see our juvenile Salmonids that are a little bit more um, reliant on the near shore. We have our Chum, our Pink, and our Chinooks. These Salmonids rely on the near shore, and particularly that kind of that shallow water wedge as a place to travel, safely avoid big predators. Um, they rely on the shade from overwater veg, um, and the food resources from that overhanging vegetation and the rack line. Um, but so there's a lot more fish and bugs and other critters, but we're actually gonna, um, I'm gonna truncate the discussion there with, with those fish, just the few that we've got there. But um, if you'd like to learn more about the fish in the near shore, I'd recommend take a look at these two documents. Both are great resources to learn a lot more about the biology on the shoreline. But let's move on from biology and detour on over. Oh, actually, we're going to do a quick, um, a quick poll, I guess. Um, and so, what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to give us, like, how you value the shoreline. What what values do you guys say? If you want to go ahead and just type into the chat box, um, and we'll we'll make sure that we're documenting the responses. I'll I'll uh, anything that. Sounds kind of interesting. I'll kind of point them out, but we'll give you a minute here or a minute or two to plug in what what your values are at the shoreline. And and the 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 nice thing is we're going to document this, and so that we can in the future cater presentations and trainings or even uh, new iterations in the guidelines to reflect those values. So um, I'm going to say go ahead and run. Give me a few of those in the chat box if you wouldn't mind. The beauty, absolutely. Shoreline's beautiful. The biological resources, like we just talked about, yes, absolutely. Archaeological resources, that's a great one. Um, habitat for fish and birds, we talk about that a little bit later. Holy smoke, look at you guys go. I haven't heard a lot of people say much about restoration. I see public access there, absolutely. I, one of my favorite values is getting out and paddle boarding um, or kayaking or um, even just access to go out and uh, go fishing and, and crabbing and shrimping, things like that. So I'm going to let you guys go ahead and if you have any other things, go ahead and continue to plug them in there. I'm going to start talking more about processes. So the shape of our shoreline. Now that we have ideas about how we value that shoreline, I'm going to talk for a little bit how we got the uh, shorelines that we have in Washington. <clears throat> Our landscape is formed by a combination of factors. Uh, generally in western Washington, our landscape was formed um, in very large scale by tectonic subduction of the uh, Juan de Fuca plate um, underneath the western edge of the North American plate. And this gives us two big mountain ranges. You can kind of see on the figure on the left there how the, uh, the, the interaction of those two plates has kind of given us two ridges. Um, to the west side we have the Olympics and to the east we have the Cascades, and then we ended up with this lowland in between, what's, uh, what's often described as a trough, and that's what we call the Puget Sound. Um, this tectonic activity is still occurring at a very slow pace, um, well finer than we can even observe to the bare eye uh, in the range of a um, couple millimeters per year. And then moving into the finer details uh, throughout our landscape, um, go ahead and cycle on, there we go. Um, they, they've been refined and formed through our multiple glaciations. So um, the picture on the left there is one of those pretty cool DNR figures about the, uh, the, the glacial action on our um, landscape. So we see the finer details in Puget Sound. Um, we see the straits, and we, this has all been formed by the uh, movement and growth and recession of glaciers, which leaves us with a pretty cool dynamic landscape. We get big piles of glacial outwash, these kind of odd little fingers of, of the Puget Sound. Um, and sometimes we get just a giant glacial erratic that seems giant, like right out, out of place, like the photo on the right there. How did that gigantic boulder end up in the river that clearly can't move it? Well, it's because of the glacier. <clears throat> so while we still have glaciers in our state on our volcanoes, we don't have any active glaciers working on our shore areas. Um, the most recent glaciation being the Vashon Glaciation, 
um, which was uh, it's a, the outline in blue on that uh, figure on the left, and that actually received up out of the state about 16,000 years ago. So we don't really see this scale occurring much anymore. Uh, what we see more frequently or more commonly is this last scale that I can speak to is what we see on the daily basis. And it's generally what we refer to when we speak of uh, shoreline or coastal processes. Now, these processes are driven uh, by weather in the form of wind, weather in the form of rain, and then um, freshwater or fluvial action, which is what we, what our rivers or streams, what I call our rivers or streams, and then the man-made changes or anthropogenic changes. These processes tend to happen to a large extent pretty acutely. So um, like 10 feet of a bluff can drop off in an instant. But in the, in the grand scheme of things, in the um, big, big view, they don't actually change the shape of our shoreline that much over time. So let's review the drivers of process. Um, note on that uh, photo on the left there, you can see the sediments, how they're all kind of striated in, in layers on there. It's actually a result of that glacial action that placed those materials there in the first place. So these processes kind of are working together. Um, but uh, the first of these aspects we're going to touch on um, is, is the, uh, the weather impacts, the natural processes. <clears throat> and um, we'll, we'll actually talk about this a little bit later in our site assessment webinar. We'll talk about how you measure some of these things. But to, to be a little bit brief about it, um, the weather, specifically rain and wind, um, wind tends to drive the movement of sediments to and through the shoreline, and its effect is manifested in the form of waves on the water surface. So high winds and uh, high winds that blow over long distances drive larger and higher energy waves, which attack sediment sources or feeder bluffs, um, which brings sediments into the system or, or what we'll call a drift cell, which we'll touch on in a little bit. Um, and then the more consistent and smaller waves um, will work and actually move the sediments through that system um, and ultimately parallel along the shoreline or along shore in what we call the drift process. Um, so we'll discuss both of the processes and how to um, identify and kind of quantify those in a later webinar. So uh, the other natural component of, of weather as a driver of shoreline process is rainfall. So rainfall is primarily a driver of source. Um, the reason for that being that rainfall causes erosion everywhere, but particularly in the uplands, which drives fine sediments into the near shore pretty regularly. And then additionally, we'll, we'll talk about this in the next webinar too, but saturated soils can lead to slope instability um, and even mass wasting, which drives upland sediments into the near shore um, system. There we go. Um, that can be by freshwater input when rivers deliver those landslide material, materials or by direct insertion into the near shore like a landslide on a bluff. So um, since I mentioned it, fluvial transport or river deltas, stream mouths can deliver a lot of sediment in a lot of systems, but the majority of the shoreline in Puget Sound is actually not driven by freshwater transport. <clears throat> which is actually the next driver of shoreline process. Um, so all natural freshwater streams, creeks, rivers, uh, they deliver sediments in some quantity to the near shore that they drain to. Um, in most cases, the quantity of sediments is relatively minor, specifically in Puget Sound, where most of our streams are pretty minor in terms of uh, flow quantity. Um, so river deltas have a lot more complicated and much more dynamic process. and um, at least in the kind of the way the, the modern world, we don't necessarily um, have a lot of infrastructure that's uh, situated really, really close to these systems, which means that as we kind of continue discussing, we'll actually neglect this process in our further discussions. We leave that to the, to the experts. So let's take a deeper dive into our shorelines and categorization, but there's one concept I want to touch on first, and that is beach alignment. <clears throat> um, so when I say beach alignment, I'm referring generally to the direction that the beach is aligned with relation to the prevailing winds and waves. Um, generally, we categorize this alignment into one of two categories, that's swash aligned and drift aligned. Um, starting with swash alignment, like the photo on the left there in San Juan County where the waves 
that approach the beach are parallel to the beach. Um, the sediment movement in this system is up and down the beach with, with little to no lateral transport. Uh, this means that repeated wave action won't move sediments necessarily laterally out of the system, they just move them up and down the beach profile itself. I've got a quick comment here, I apologize for kind of blowing right by that, but there is a note about interface of terrestrial and marine physical and ecological processes. Um, absolutely an impact and a driver of the, um, the shoreline process. Um, not something that we delve into a lot in the MSDG, uh, so I'll leave that one to the experts. Uh, so um, back to the slide that I've got up here. Um, so in the case of a pocket beach, which is what you see in the picture there, there's usually a nick point on either side of the beach, something like a rocky headland, which keeps the sediments in the system and it will um, kind of mitigate some of the ephemeral drift process that might occur there by, by, uh, by uh, odd winds and things like that. But then the, uh, the opposite of a swash aligned system would be a drift aligned beach. Um, the, they're beaches that are subject to waves at a skew, which will throw sediments up on the beach at an angle where gravity then forces the recession of that water and suspended sediment back down the beach perpendicular to the beach. Um, so I tried to add arrows on the photos here that will kind of demonstrate that, but ultimately that, that throwing and receding, throwing and receding leads to a lateral transport of those sediments through the system. Um, it'd be hilarious if somebody looked in this room and saw me because I'm gesturing all over the place with my hands. But um, So anyways, drift aligned beaches do gain and lose sediments from the adjacent beaches and bluffs, most of our beaches in Puget Sound are drift aligned, which is why we oftentimes talk about the drift direction on a beach. So let's talk more about the drift process and what is a drift cell. So here's my simplified drift cell. The top of the figure there is an approximated aerial of a short drift cell. And then the arrows are indicating sediment movement on there. The main idea here is that drift cells throughout our shoreline start with a source. Um, and we call those our feeder bluffs, it moves through a mostly transport zone, and then we'll settle out in our um, deposition areas or our accretion shore forms, or those sediments will ultimately get transported offshore. So um, there's photos below of each of these zones from a drift cell in a, uh, a natural and unimpacted location out on McNeil Island. So real briefly running through each of these um, each of these areas, we start at the feeder bluff on the far left. The bluff is contributing sediment, so you'll see raw banks, you'll see uprooted vegetation on the beach. Um, you'll see a more inconsistent beach elevation, you'll see piles of materials. And then the main, main movement of sediments in these systems are off the bluff and onto the beach, and then downdrift out into the next zone, which is the transport zone in the next picture there. And the transport zone, you tend to see a little bit more consistent beach. Um, the area will probably accrete or degrade ephemerally, but generally the same amount of sediments that move into the system are moving out of the system. So there should be a lot of change. Um, you'll see these have a relatively a cleaner beach because there's not as much material coming off of the bluff. Um, and oftentimes you'll see that these have a back beach. They can have a dune behind them. They can have a slope or a bluff in the back, like you see in the picture there. Uh, in the transport zone, sediments are trans transported laterally along the beach and up and down the beach a little bit, but generally not out of the bluff or out of the hill slopes. And then on the far right, we have our depositional area or accretion shore form, which is where sediments will stop transporting further along the beach, and they'll either settle out and cause accretion, or they'll transport out, out of the system into deep water. So keep in mind, this is, again, um, this is our drift aligned system. So let's take a quick look at what we see in those systems when that gets interrupted or messed with. So on a bluff <clears throat> at the upper end of the drift cell, you can see, um, so here's a photo, home on a short bluff, home's very close to the top of the slope. As a result, the homeowner armored the entire face of that bluff with, uh, with a, a revetment, which has cut off the source, potential source of sediment. Um, where they should really be kind of dropping into the system there. The results probably some interim stability. Um, unfortunately, I hope you, can, you guys can see the uh, longer term concern um, that's based off of putting something static and, and, uh, and very um, monolithic in a dynamic system. Ultimately, it's not going to necessarily help the problem. 
Uh, so, so then we look at what happens down drift or at the adjacent beach. The beach is degraded vertically to a hard cemented layer. Um, that, that won't degrade anymore. So the beach has begun to recede landward. And the source of sediment in the system has been removed, but the drift process continues. The waves continue to work that beach, removing sediments from the beach down drift, which means that the next beach that isn't armored, um, like we see on the photo on the right there, receives the uh, receives the brunt of that process and contributes sediments to that drift cell. So as the beach has receded, the banks Im immediately adjacent start to recede as well. And now we see um, things like what we see on the photo on the left here, which is the down drift end of the wall we saw in the previous photo that was at the face of the that house. And the beach is receding behind the wall and endangering the home. So speaking generally, the impacts that we see when we armor a bluff are that the beach, uh, we see a disconnection from the back beach or bluff to the um, beach profile. The profile will often flatten and the upper portion of that beach, which would form that transition disappears. Um, and essentially we get stuck with a, a bluff or, um, or a, a slope um, and a low, pro low profile beach in space. So uh, moving down the drift cell here, <clears throat> we look at our transport zones. Here's a natural transport zone. Uh, a quick note, these are actually photos from restoration projects. So um, we're actually going to go back in time to look at the impact inversion of these for, for the next two zones. So um, here's a photo of that natural transport zone. You can see on the left, there's a nice rack line that's probably got a bunch of bugs in it. And you can see the beach profile somewhat steep. There's a nice sediment gradient to the beach face. Um, you, can, you can kind of see that. You can see that there's sand and small gravels. Um, and then a little bit further down the beach, it goes, it gets larger, we get bigger gravels and cobbles, and then transitions back down into sands and fines. Um, we get uh, gravel depositions at the beachward base, uh, the backward beach, uh, sorry, of the back beach, um, which in this case is a spit. <clears throat> it's great habitat for a range of critters. There's a, a depositional storm berm and rack line and driftwood that's accumulated on the, the back of that back berm. A quick note, you'll see that the wood is actually very, very regular along that uh, spit. That's because we put it there. Um, but it's great habitat for shorebirds and other non-aquatic mammals that rely on the shoreline habitats. Um, unfortunately, the habitat isn't necessarily valued as um, that habitat. It gets valued more for building structures or facilitating exposure to the shore. Um, so let's go back in time real quick and see what this looked like um, before when it was impacted. <clears throat> so, we see the, uh, the, the bulkhead here, um, and ultimately to these transport zones, hardening can result in less transient deposition of drift materials. Um, we'll see loss of spawning habitat for forage fish and disconnection of the beach to that back beach. Um, and we'll see beach coarsening and recession due to the wave impact and scour. Um, so, the back beach that's been isolated, that habitat I mentioned earlier for birds and other non and semi aquatic critters, is no longer connected and um, oftentimes turns into a human habitat, a house, yard. Um, in this photo, you, you can kind of see that it's been overrun by invasives because we aren't, we aren't getting that natural interface there. We've got a bunch of blackberries and a bunch of ivy and things like that. Um, but you can see there's no rack line um, where we had more sands and more of a textural gradient on the beach. We now have cobbles and big gravels. And the profile of that beach has changed. It's, it's definitely flattened out. Um, there's no deposition, deposited rack or driftwood, um, and like I said, that, that back beach has been um, invaded by invasive vegetation. And so moving down to our, our last zone here, we have our <clears throat> depositional areas. Um, so a natural depositional zone, again, restoration project. Um, it's an accretion beach that's trying to form a lagoon in the back beach there. Uh, similar components to the transport zone. It's got a very dynamic beach profile. Um, with a, a, an occasional steep and a little bit flatter profile um, base and a textural gradient. You know, we go from sands to gravels to cobbles and back down to sands and fines as we get closer to mean lower low water. Um, we see salt tolerant vegetation along the face of that uh, and, you know, kind of generally growing in zones. Uh, driftwood and rack material are intermittently depositing and drifting away. Similar to the transport zone, this back beach, very, very good habitat. Um, and so let's let's go back in time real quick one more time and see what this guy looked like before when it was impacted. And you can see, uh, so the bulkhead's actually being removed at this location at the time. 
But um, for demonstration purposes, I'd like to note there's no rack, right? There's no driftwood um, near the face of that wall, and there's very little uh, material up on the top of the area there. You, obviously, you can't see it because it's been excavated. Um, got a question here, which beach plants should we look at for indicators of good beach habitat? That's a great question. I'm going to probably actually defer that to the experts. But generally, what I tend to look for is uh, things like saltgrass, uh, pickleweed, dune grass on more of our depositional and gravelly features. Um, but I can certainly follow up with more information on that. So uh, back to the our armored depositional area. The beach has a, a much more poorly graded texture. You can see that it's not changing much. There's just a whole bunch of sand there. And the profile of the beach is flatter. Uh, the excavated grade on the photo is about the same as the top of the previous photo. Um, so you can see that the vertical wall has actually isolated that back beach from the, uh, the dynamic beach itself in the drift zone there. And so the back beach habitat, which was uh, the, the wall was constructed to make a parking lot, um, and then it was abandoned. But even though it had been abandoned in the range of 10 to 20 years, it was still essentially a parking lot. We didn't get any of that connection, any of that transitional habitat. Um, so we didn't get any, again, no swash, no washover. We had poor vegetation and almost no habitat complexity. So uh, now that I've touched on the drivers of the shoreline, I, I forgot to mention that the uh, those last three slides were my discussion of, sorry, six slides were my discussion of the anthropogenic impacts to the shoreline. Um, what other threats do you guys out there see as um, threats to the shoreline? Go ahead and, uh, again, plug your um, ideas into the chat box. I'll throw out, I'll comment a few of those that come up, and I'll think of a good one here. Um, I see sea level rise. Absolutely. Uh, and development. Yeah, so sea level rise, that's a good one. We'll, we'll hear more about that in webinar four. Um, and some of what we expect to see as a result of sea level rise. Unrestricted upland drainage, that's a good one. <laughs> Wealthy waterfront property owner. I'm not going to discuss that on much, but um, tideland ownership, that's a huge issue. Highway 101. Ocean acidification, absolutely. Stormwater. Um, a lot of these actually very well um, intertwined, right? A lot of those, I mean, the highway, the stormwater runoff, um, the overwater structures, the development, very, very similar types of impacts. Um, septics, absolutely. All right, so again, I'm going to ask you guys continue to, um, to to plug in those things as they come to your mind. Um, we'll document this and hopefully we can keep track of all of that and incorporate it into other stuff, other presentations, other trainings, um, and we'll we'll move on. Awesome. Thanks, Corey, uh, for that overview of what's going on at a site. Now let's turn to what is going on behind the permit counter. Nicole and I are going to give a brief overview of the permitting environment. So as many of our listeners probably know, permitting in the marine environment is really complex. The important issues to remember is that um, there's a lot of overlap. So for example, overlap between jurisdictions, we've got local, state, federal, tribal, for example, the types of reporting that might be required. So for example, geotechnical review, biological assessments, and also the issues that are being evaluated, such as land use, construction practices, and impacts to resources. So the first question when navigating this, especially for an applicant who's never done this before, is simply, where should I start? A lot of folks are probably familiar um, with this very good place to start, which is the JARPA form, the Joint Aquatic Resources Permit Application Form. This is a form that can help guide applicants through the coordinated permitting process. It can help an applicant determine which permits might be needed from the various regulatory agencies and identify key information that the permitting agencies are looking for. Um, it's important to remember the JARPA itself is not a permit. It only acts to help guide the applicant through the permitting process and ask questions about permits. And of course, the applicant is responsible for getting any of the required materials to the various agencies. We have a link to the JARPA form and some additional resources on the Coastal Planners Group website. And another great resource for anyone, um, whether they're an applicant or someone who works in the field, to uh, try to demystify the permitting process 
is the state of Washington's Office of Regulatory and Innovation Assistance, or ORIA. They have information on permit processes, they have some really nice flowcharts that you can download, expected timelines, and there's even a questionnaire that folks can fill out to help identify the different permits that an applicant might be required to get. And again, the link to ORIA is shown here, oria.wa.gov, and it's also on the SCPG website. Um, since I work for the Department of Ecology, I'm going to briefly discuss um, the local permitting process for shoreline projects. It's probably a review for some listeners, but let's just set the stage. Um, so the highest level of law in this context is the State Shoreline Management Act, or SMA, and it's administered by the Department of Ecology. So ecology sets the guidelines and then local governments adopt those guidelines into their own plans, their shoreline master programs, and these are approved by the Department of Ecology. Local shoreline master programs or SMPs cover three permit types. Those are the shoreline substantial development permits, conditional use permits and variances. And then there are also exemptions for certain project types. And for exemptions, this means that the applicant, they still need to comply with land use and environmental review standards that are found in the SMP, but they're simply exempt from having to obtain a substantial development permit. So bulkhead projects for single family residences are one common type of these exemptions that I'm sure many of you have seen before. A quick note about jurisdictional line, since it's both a regulatory element and a technical consideration that needs to be determined site by site. The jurisdiction of the Shoreline Management Act is the ordinary high watermark and 200 feet landward. So where is that found? Uh, the ordinary high watermark is a mark on the landscape denoted by vegetation, which is caused by the common and usual presence and action of water. Since this is a physical marker of water, uh, water's presence and location on the landscape, and we all know that water is very dynamic, the ordinary high water mark can move. Therefore, it's critical to have an accurate survey of the ordinary high water mark at the site to properly determine shoreline jurisdiction. As we discussed at the outset of this webinar, the amount of new bulkheading on Puget Sound is the lowest that it's been in decades. Um, Bulk, uh, new bulkheads are still happening, they're still important to know about, um, but we know that a lot of the action on the shoreline is actually through repairs, replacements, and emergencies, and also restoration work. So as we mentioned earlier, replacement bulkheads are the most common project type that we see, and they also pre uh, present opportunities to reevaluate the need for a bulkhead at a given site. So for example, in the photo on the left, we have a bulkhead or what's left of a bulkhead that's not really protecting anything. And this structure, um, it's not protecting any structure, I should say, and it could probably be removed. Whereas the bulkhead on the right would serve to protect that house that otherwise would probably be at risk given its proximity to the shoreline. Um, repairs are also very common, um, though the extent of work for a repair might not rise to the same level as a replacement. A repair could just be replacing a couple piles on a timber bulkhead or sealing a crack in a concrete wall. Um, Ecology's SMP guidelines allow for local jurisdictions to define what constitutes a repair versus a replacement. So we do see some variability between jurisdictions. Um, in some ways, the requirements for replacements are similar to new projects, especially in that the need for the replacement project must be demonstrated. So the SMP guidelines or Ecology's WAX, Washington Administrative Code, they say that replacement projects do require a demonstrated need, but local jurisdictions have the latitude to define what is acceptable documentation for demonstrating that need. And another key difference between new and replacement projects is that a geotechnical report is not required um, under the WAC. However, some jurisdictions SMPs do require geotechnical, uh, geotechnical reports. Others look to photos or site visits. And so we want to highlight replacements first because they are so prevalent on the shoreline and also because we hope that the MSDG resources will assist you with the review of replacements because we know that a lot of our local planners are seeing them. <clears throat> 
Um, before I move on, I see a quick question in the chat about interpretations of the ordinary high watermark. Looks like Corey's responding. Um, we might come back to it at the end for Q&A because um, we might want to respond verbally, but thank you. We see your questions. We're keeping track of them and we will address them at the end. So keep typing them in. Um, so moving on to emergencies. Emergency authorizations are also fairly common, especially during winter storm seasons when we have um, particularly bad storms. However, um, the volume of emergency requests uh, does vary by jurisdiction, especially considering that some areas like Island County are way more exposed than um, shorelines that are tucked deep into bays or really deep um, in the sound and not getting those big Pacific Ocean waves. Jurisdictions around Puget Sound also use different methods for authorizing emergency work. Some jurisdictions have staff in-house that are able to make a determination of whether a situation is an emergency. Other jurisdictions will look to their regional habitat biologist from DFW to make that call, especially since a habitat biologist um, would be needing to issue an emergency HPA for any work that occurred. And important reminder, um, regardless of how the emergency is authorized, um, work that is authorized still needs to obtain the relevant shoreline permit or exemption through after the fact permitting, which I think is something applicants tend to forget. Um, now I'll pass it on to Nicole to continue the discussion. Thanks, Sydney. I am going to take on talking a bit about some of the state and federal additional permits. Again, from a very high level, these are the kinds of things that when we're dealing with shoreline stabilization are important to know. So first we'll turn to the Washington permit process known as the HPA, Hydraulic Project Approval Permit. The overriding purpose for this permit is to protect fish and habitat and it applies to work that uses or diverts or obstructs or changes the flow or, or the bed of fresh salt water and fresh water in the state of Washington. So examples are doing bank protection projects, dredging, fish passage, flow control structures, over water structures and pilings. And the permitting process is found online, but it's important to note that DFW will not approve an HPA until after a SEPA review or the State Environmental Protection Act, Policy Act, SEPA, has been issued by the local government. Uh, single family residential bulkheads used to be exempt from the HPA process, but that changed in 2019. Bulkheads at or below ordinary high water now must submit an, an application for an HPA. So where does the HPA apply? The historical line of jurisdiction for an HPA was at or below the ordinary high water mark, similar to the jurisdiction for SMA that Sydney talked about. However, in 2016, the state attorney general issued an opinion stating the authority of WDFW to issue HPAs that step, extend upland where there are effects on the state water. So it's very important for the HPA to coordinate with the local government because of the two overlapping jurisdictions and permitting process, particularly where they're with respect to mitigation and also for the SEPA approval. At the federal level, there are two different types of permits involved when seeking authorization for shoreline stabilization. They'd be the section 10, section 404, those two jurisdictions are based on tidal datum, which is different from the ordinary high water discussion we had about jurisdiction for both the HPA and uh, the uh, shoreline permitting. So section 10 is based on the River and Harbors Act, and it regulates any activity that obstructs or alters navigable waters of the United States. So that would include docks and piers, floats, wharves, dol dolphins and marinas. And then the 404 permit process is authorized under the Clean Water Act, and that applies to fill and dredge activities. These are activities including placement of fill material, grading, mechanized land clearing, redepositing re 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 of excavated or dredged materials. So the jurisdiction under the, for the Corps of Engineers is different. So section 10 
of the extent extends to the mean high water line, which is the arithmetic mean of the high water heights observed over a period of 19 years of cycle. And that is not the mean high tide line though. Then the section 404 is uh, jurisdiction is different. And that is you, you use the mean high, higher high water line. And as you can see, it is higher up on the shoreline, that jurisdiction than the section 10. It should be noted that this jurisdiction of the core is currently being litigated. And because of the current location, many shoreline stabilization projects don't involve the core permitting. However, that may change depending on the outcome of the lawsuit. Now, there are generally two types of core permits. There's individual permits, standard or letter of permission, or general permits nationwide and regional permits. Typically with restor the restoration projects and with the shoreline stabilization, we see the use of the nationwide permitting. An important note related to shoreline stabilization is that a new sh programmatic permit is in the process of being developed by National Marine Fisheries Service and that will, would be used by the Corps of Engineers for activities including bulkheads and overwater coverage. And so keep aware that more information should be coming out about this new programmatic permit pretty, in, pretty soon. Uh, ESA consultation. So depending upon the complexity and the location of a project, the applicant may need to coordinate with both National Marine Fisheries Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. They would need to review and give the Corps of, of Engineers approval for a project before Corps can issue the permit. NIMPS and U.S. Fish and Wildlife re re review projects to determine what are the impacts on listed species of plants, fish, birds, and other animals in the waters of the U.S. that are endangered or threatened under the ESA. The documentation that's required is a biological assessment or in its short form, a biological evaluation. Some nationwide permits also use an abbreviated document that's called a SPIF form. I'm going to touch then just on two additional review requirements that are fed required for federal permits, but are authorized and coordinated through the Department of Ecology. First is the coastal zone management. Projects are reviewed by ecology to determine if they're consistent with the state's coastal zone management policies. For example, related to the Shoreline Management Act, SEPA, the Clean Water Act, or the Clean Air Act. The other review process for federal permits is the 401 water quality certification, and this applies if a pro project is discharging into the waters of the U.S. And EPA has delegated this authority to ecology to conduct this review. Uh, and the, co the Corps of Engineers can't issue its permit until it has that 401 water quality permit and review. So let's touch on cultural, cultural and historic resources. There are over 30 tribes in this region with usual in Washington state with usual and accustomed fishing grounds. And in addition, there are tribal cultural resources that need to be taken into consideration when working in the shoreline. At the federal level, there's a requirement for nation to nation consultation. So for example, the Corps of Engineers must consult with a tribe before issuing a permit. This means the project applicants need to be aware of the possibility that there may be cultural resources on the site and be aware that the pro of this process early on. The consultation process is called the 106, Section 106 process. And you can find uh, some resources on the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation website, and it gives you resources on how to go through the 106 process. Also at the state level, be aware of requirements for consultation for cultural resources, where there's a state capital construction funding or land acquisition that, is take, that includes state funding. This came about as a result of the governor's executive order 0505. And so consultation with the state historic preservation office is required. 
There are resources for understanding the state process, and they can be found on the uh, Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation for Washington website. There's a brand new guidebook that just came out in January that talks about this Washington State Standards for Cultural Resource Permitting, and it's a great resource. And you can also start with the WISSARD, W-I-S-S-A-R-D site to put to, that's put together by the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation to identify whether or not there might be cultural historical resources on a site. Work in floodplain requires permits and FEMA coordination. Uh, local jurisdictions participate in the National Flood, Insur National Flood Insurance Program and must, must issue floodplain permits if a project is within the floodplains that are identified on our FEMA maps. There's been a change in the role and the requirements recently for local jurisdictions issuing that who issue these floodplain permits. And this is based on a lawsuit that was filed in 2014 that challenged FEMA on whether the permits being issued through this NFIP process violated the Endangered Species Act. So in 2008, a biological opinion, uh, opinion was issued and it required more scrutiny at the local level uh, when issuing floodplain permits. Put the onus on the local government to review their permit processes and offered three ways that they could comply. They're called door one, door two, and door three. So door one is the process of adopting model ordinances. Door two is a, creating a programmatic approach that had been approved by FEMA. And door three is to review on a case-by-case -case basis the local permit decisions. Should be noted that most jurisdictions in Washington have chosen to follow the case-by-case -case permit process. However, it's important to be aware of what each jurisdiction has done. And if you're, you're working with different jurisdictions, ask them how they're working through this process. And one of the important changes has been the preparation, the need to prepare a habitat assessment for a project. So I'm going to end with just some emerging issues to be aware of that we've briefly touched on that are with respect to the, both the state, local, local, state, and federal permitting processes. So with respect to shoreline permits, periodic reviews are an opportunity. They're coming up, and they're an opportunity for jurisdictions to make changes to their shoreline master programs. Right now, we're at the tail end of that process and jurisdictions have been dealing with their armor regulations. So now is an opportunity to make some of those changes to improve implementation. It's not required, but it is an opportunity if there are issues local governments want to address. Also, compliance is a second issue under that ecology will be focusing more attention on with permits issued under SMPs and SMA. It's statewide and it's gonna be focused on many different SMA issues, not just armory. But it's a new focus that's in its infancy, so stay tuned for more. With respect to the hydraulic project approvals, the important merging issues are to be aware of this new jurisdiction that is above ordinary high water. And then the second issue is to the new rules that were issued this last year changed the way DFW is reviewing bulkhead applications. And there's now a requirement to provide a demonstration of need in order to get approval for a bulkhead permit. And with respect to the Corps of Engineers, keep your eye out for the new nearshore programmatic that's coming out this spring. Also, be aware that the law, a lawsuit about core jurisdiction may be settled this spring. And if so, it may change when the core becomes involved in projects and in shoreline stabilization projects. And if that jurisdiction change, the core may have a much more active role in the permitting process for shoreline stabilization projects more than they do now. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Sydney. Thanks, Nicole, um, for rounding out that overview of the permits and also for letting us know what might be coming down the pipeline. Um, we do want to take our remaining time for some questions. So I know we already got a couple in the chat box that we will address. Uh, if you have any more burning questions that you haven't sent us already, 
please go ahead and type those into the chat box. And while you are thinking and typing, let's give you a reminder about the second webinar. Um, webinar two will be held, uh, held next week on Tuesday, same time, um, 9.30 till 11 on February 18th. And it is going to cover site assessments. So things that Corey mentioned, like diving more into those technical assessments of fetch and waves and looking at soil and discuss, first of all, what the Marine Shoreline Design Guides uh, guidelines say about that. And then also talk about how um, that can inform the demonstration of need discussion, um, which is uh, uh, started or, or required um, by the SMP and HPA. So if you're not already registered, for webinar two or webinars three and four, um, we encourage you to visit our website, coastalplanners.org slash webinars and register for each of those. And also if you uh, want a recording of these webinars, uh, they're gonna be posted on the website as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at the chat box. Um, so we got a question from Richard about uh, the lawsuit regarding the core jurisdiction. And so, um, Nicole touched on it a little bit, but to give a little bit more detail about that, um, it was a lawsuit brought by environmental groups. So I believe Earth Justice and Sound Action were also involved. And it was basically where, what title datum should uh, the Corps be using to regulate bulkheads specifically on Puget Sound. So as Nicole was mentioning, um, a lot of bulkheads that we see nowadays don't um, enter into the mean higher high water and below. So they're, they're not getting core permits. They're not getting that core review. And what the plaintiffs in the lawsuit are arguing is that um, that jurisdictional line should be higher up on the shoreline. And so as far as I understand, and I, none of us who are hosting this webinar work for the core, so please don't take what we're saying as you know, the be all end all. But what I understand is that the plaintiffs are asking for the jurisdictional line to go up to mean annual highest tide, which is an average of the highest observed tides over a 19 year period. And this would bring um, up to about 8,600 acres, I believe, of shoreline. Um, I forget exactly what the unit of area is, but it would bring a lot more shoreline into core jurisdiction. And that would, um, the core is potentially going to be taking that extra jurisdiction on a case by case basis. And so as far as I understand, um, the results of the lawsuit are going to be announced um, in the coming months. And so please stay tuned for that. Um, and great, it looks like um, Gwendolyn has posted some information into the chat. So if you're curious about that, please go ahead and read more. Um, the second question we had was from Scott about compensatory mitigation. Does compensatory mitigation fit into emerging issues? So I'm going to pass that over to Corey to talk about that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be a little bit brief about that because it, it, the mitigation requirement, it extends beyond just a, an individual agency, but it absolutely is an emerging issue. And it's one that um, there's more coming information. Uh, Nicole touched on a little bit the uh, the, up, the the work that's currently going on with um, I believe it's NOAA's um, programmatic. I can't speak to any specifics about that, but there will be some more information coming about that in the in the coming months. Um, and I know speaking from from the state perspective, that's a it, it gets handled on a very very much a case by case basis. Um, but we generally are, are uh, our marching orders are to follow the mitigation sequencing that's described in the hydraulic code. And I believe that stands true for um, other state agencies. Um, <clears throat> so yes, it, it's, it's an issue and it's something that's kind of an ongoing continuing issue. Um, and we'll see some, some information coming out of the, the NOAA programmatic uh, as, as that gets further developed and rolled out. Great, thanks, Corey. Um, next question from Allison Warner. What is the state doing to get out ahead of increased bulkheading demand as sea level rise progresses? Well, that is a great question that we are gonna try to touch on in our fourth webinar, which is gonna be focused on uh, shoreline stabilization in the context of sea level rise. Right now, a lot of the um, response to bulkhead demand in general and with sea level rise is being handled at the local level. 
um, the state, so Department of Ecology and others like Sea Grant and other groups are part of a, um, a grant that just ended called the Washington Coastal Resilience Project. And that was all about focusing on just understanding sea level rise better, getting new projections, which we're gonna hear more about in webinar four. So um, I'll go ahead and um, ask if one of my um, co-hosts can drop a link to the website that we have all about sea level rise and the latest state of the knowledge that we have. It's the Washington Coastal Hazards Resilience Network. But in terms of what the state is doing, um, as you uh, may or may not be aware, we don't in the state of Washington have a top-down directive. So for example, from the legislature to plan for sea level rise. So a lot of the action that we're seeing is being driven by local governments and this network of partners um, that were part of that Washington Coastal Resilience Project grant are working to share lessons learned, um, get information to local jurisdictions, help them speak with one another about what they're seeing, and um, some resources that uh, Nicole and I are working on. We're going to talk more about um, specifically related to sea level rise and armoring in webinar four. All right, so the next question we have is from Lisa. Does the new HPA process for bulkheads include new and replacement bulkheads? Is it going to have a focus on demonstrating why softshore armoring isn't an option when applicants want hard armoring? Um, I think, Corey, I'm gonna pass that to you at least for the first part. And then I think the second, the second part of that question relates to some current uh, legislation that's being proposed, but Corey, I'll let you handle that first part. Certainly, absolutely. So yes, the, the the new process, at least as I understand it, will be um, handling new and replacement bulkheads. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's that, that's actually, I believe it's undergoing rulemaking right now. So um, there will be more to come on that as well. And um, I will speak real quickly to um, whether or not there will be a focus of demonstrating why Softshore isn't an option. But I believe that is going to be a component of the rulemaking that goes in um, as part of kind of the demonstration of need. So, Sydney, if you'd like to, to weigh in on that, feel free. Um, sure. I'm Corey, you're the expert on the HPA. And then for the second part of that question, um, the HPA process and, and having a focus on demonstrating uh, why soft shore armoring isn't an option. Um, I think this relates to um, Senate Bill 6147 that was proposed in this legislative session. Um, let's see. I'm currently on the uh, Washington State Legislature uh, legislative page um, to see what the current status of the bill is. I admit I, I've been out of town, I've been traveling, so I haven't been tracking this bill really closely. Um, so currently um, in the rules, as far as I understand them, um, the HPA process, at least for replacements, does not focus on that alternatives analysis, and that's what Senate Bill 6147 was addressing. I admit I have not been following the bill to see if it made it out of the committee. So please someone correct me if I'm wrong or if one of my co-hosts knows the answer to that. Um, but as far as replacements, the soft shore analysis isn't currently in there and that's why they were trying to um, make a new law about that. Corey, I don't know if you've been following that bill at all. I, I can't say I have. I've, I've uh, been emphasizing other areas. So I'm, I've, I'm, I'm not very well apprised of that. Well, I'm going to put a link um, to that information right in the chat. So if folks want to read more about it, please check that out. Um, next uh, point in the chat is actually a comment from Kaylin. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Worth mentioning that if the work does not occur entirely on private property, that a DNR aquatic use authorization may be required. That's a great point, um, especially since um, Hopefully, if anything that you took away from that discussion is that it is really complex. It's complex for the folks who are working in the field who at some point or another touch this on a daily basis. It can still be really confusing. And then also for an applicant who's never dealt with this before, it can be incredibly complex. So um, local governments can be a great resource. ORIA can be a great resource. The JARPA website can be a great resource, but the permitting environment is you know, admittedly complicated. It's for a good reason, it, it, to protect natural resources, protect cultural resources, um, all those things, but for an applicant, it can be very challenging. 
Next question um, in the chat, will Ecology or DFW be able to provide technical assistance to local jurisdictions? Specifically, can staff be available fairly quickly for site visits? That's a great question. I'll speak um, to the Ecology side and then I'll give it to Corey. Yes, so our regional staff, so for Puget Sound would be our Northwest and Southwest regions. And yes, our staff are available to conduct site visits. So our staff, um, specifically our um, technical assistance staff can conduct ordinary high watermark determinations. They can go and speak to a local jurisdiction about um, different permitting requirements, what types of permits might be needed for a project. Um, and so Corey, is there a similar resource li uh, like that available from DFW? Well, we, we, we provide technical assistance, mostly the folks out of my office, the, the Habitat Engineering Office. Um, I can't necessarily speak for how quickly we can get out to site visits, but if you do reach out to us, um, we, we have made it a priority to get out and um, take a look at these things. Uh, that's also, um, I, I don't know that it's going to be incorporated, but some of the shore friendly programs, I believe, are going to have um, a process for site visits as well. That's a great point, Corey. So for folks who aren't familiar with Shore Friendly, and I think we even have some Shore Friendly folks um, watching this webinar, um, it's a program that's been around for several years, but it recently got incorporated onto D under DFW's ESRP grant program. And so there's a Shore Friendly program in all areas of Puget Sound. And the different um, programs, their focus varies throughout the region, but they're available to assist homeowners and also can help um, provide resources to local governments. So for example, a local government has someone who comes to the permit counter. That person wants to know more about soft shore or drainage management or just generally what to do on their site. The shore friendly programs can be a great resource for that. So maybe I'll ask one of my co-conspirators to drop a link to shore friendly information um, in the chat as well. The next question, um, what are the best resources to determine river flows and associated velocities? That sounds like a question for Corey. It, it certainly does. So um, that's actually kind of a tough question to answer. Uh, there, there are resources out there. There's a lot of gauges specifically on rivers um, in the uh, in the region, I, I'll say that not necessarily a lot of those are actively monitored. There's a lot of them that have been installed historically, um, and in the recent past, to develop some of the, uh, the the regression equations that we use to estimate flows in rivers. But I will, um, I believe it's the USGS that who, who monitors a lot of those gauges as well as individual counties, oftentimes have uh, gauging systems. I know Snohomish County, King County, and Kitsap County all maintain gauges um, on some of the more mm, critical or um, more flood happy streams and rivers that are in, in our region, as well as the Department of Ecology has a, a gauging resource. They don't have a ton of gauges necessarily though. So um, there's, the determining river flows, I mean, you can go out and measure it in associated velocities, but that's kind of a whole different topic. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave that to another discussion, but I could refer you to maybe the, uh, um, the water crossing design guidelines that, that the same, my group uh, puts out, it's um, part of the aquatic habitat guidelines that has a few resources as to how you can um, measure and estimate flows. Awesome. Thanks, Corey. And a couple notes um, from folks in the chat. So um, for questions about DNR jurisdiction, um, you can check in with a DNR aquatic land manager on aquatic land boundaries, and there might be a certain use authorization that's required. And then also we've had a couple habitat biologists or folks who know um, about habitat bios who are um, saying that habitat bios are available for site visits for HPA consultations. And I know um, just having spoken with local governments that habitat bios can be a great resource before the HPA is issued because it, uh, habitat bios do have a lot of knowledge about the shoreline. And so they're another great resource that local governments can use. And it looks like Megan has dropped a link 
um, for uh, habitat biologist coverage of the region. So that's a great resource. Um, maybe we can add that to the Coastal Planners Group website um, for local governments to um, figure out who their habitat bio is. Let's see, scrolling back up, um, a, a question from Megan, where are we sourcing beach material and are there certain parameters for required substrate sizes that we can find for permitting? I think that would be a question for Corey. Certainly, absolutely. So uh, that's a great question. Um, and, and you might have better luck asking some of the folks that, that are installing these projects more on a more frequent basis. But generally, um, you're going to get it from a pit somewhere nearby. Um, and for the most part, that gets screened because we don't necessarily want a ton of fines being dumped onto the beach, even though fines get dumped on the beach when we have landslides. But um, I would refer you to um, our the, the guidelines, and we'll touch on this a little bit later. But there are there's some guidance out there about uh, sizing your um, like beach nourishment type materials um, based off of the different conditions you have at your site. Um, my go-to is to match either what's on the beach itself or match um, what's on an adjacent good habitat beach so that we are, are replicating that habitat. That doesn't necessarily help as, as well as it could um, for like a soft shore type of design because it, it might be a little less resilient to um, degradation and, and mobilizing, but it matches the habitat the best way possible. So again, we've got some of that information in the guidelines. There's also um, some specifications out there. I know the, uh, that there's a provision for surf smelt spawning and um, I believe a provision for sandland spawning that gets added to HPA. Um, and it, it doesn't actually match very well with what's recommended in the guidelines, but that's something that we, you know, continuing to rectify. So. Awesome, thanks, Corey. So moving just chronologically in the chat, um, Gwendolyn posted um, a resource about the Army Corps um, lawsuit, so check that out. And then Richard says um, in Massachusetts what the Corps is using um, for Section 404 permitting. So that'll it'll be really interesting to see what ends up happening with that lawsuit. And again, I you know who knows what will happen. I I certainly don't know. Um, a question from Nora. How do we find out which review process or door a local jurisdiction has chosen in order to implement the 2008 FEMA buy-op? And I'll jump right in on this one, Nicole. And the best way is when you're working with a local jurisdiction, make sure that you're asking. For those of you who are local jurisdictions, you already, if you don't know whoever is your floodplain permit person or department, they will know. But the best is to go directly to the jurisdictions because they've all been involved in it and are uh, required to respond and address floodplain permitting based on the approach that they've chosen to take. Great, thanks, Nicole. Um, a question from Nicole. Um, Nicole Foster uh, says, Nicole Fagan mentioned that WDFW's new jurisdiction is above the ordinary high watermark. Has guidance been released on where their new jurisdiction will be? I think that's a question for Corey. Corey, I, I can't remember if you touched on this already or not. Well, both of us could talk I, about it. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So this is Corey. Um, the, uh, I want to clarify real quick. Um, the, the question is our new jurisdiction, it's, I, I would, I'd argue it's not necessarily new jurisdiction, it's been clarification. Um, the, uh, the code, the RCW that gives us jurisdiction actually never was tied to a specific benchmark, or at least in my, to my knowledge it wasn't. Um, and it's kind of been assumed that that was at or above ordinary high. And um, there was a challenge to our jurisdiction from, um, I believe it was the Association of Washington Counties. And uh, our claim was that we have jurisdiction over anything that drains to or impacts the, uh, the shoreline or the waters of the state. And it was a response to that that the uh, Washington Supreme Court put out a, an opinion um, based off of what I believe was the existing code. And I can double check if any of that information on um, if that's available to the public. I know we've got some guidance and some policy documents internally. Um, but I'll double check and see if that actually is something that, that 
that we put out there for everyone to see. Um, but generally, the, the guidance has been that anything that will impact waters of the state um, it, or, or, the, or, or, or the beaches that they, that they run up on is, is under HPA jurisdiction. And so I, think, I believe that's left up to the, um, the uh, I can't think of the word, the, the opinion or the assessment of the habitat biologist. So, and, but I can definitely double check on that. Great, thanks, Corey. Um, I know we've gotten a couple questions about recording of the webinar. So yes, they're gonna be posted at um, our website, coastalplanners.org slash webinars. And then um, Nicole, I think you were saying that before we post them, they have to be captioned in order for them to be accessible. So that'll just take a few, well, I don't know exactly how long that's gonna take Nicole, but yes, they will be posted on our website and I will drop that in the chat right now. And so what we're going to do is take everything, the recording, and we'll take also all the, the PowerPoints with our speaking notes. And both of those will be posted on the Shoreline Coastal Planner Group website. And we will send this out to all of you who are participating in the webinar, along with a request for you to give us some feedback and a survey about the webinar. So keep a lookout in your email for the notification about the, the uh, webinars being posted and for a survey. Great, thank you, Nicole. So I think there are two more questions left in the chat and also a couple comments. So first the comments, one from Stephanie, pretty important to figure this out. I think um, uh, bulkheads and sea level rise, since replacements that increase size, so for example, in response to sea level rise are actually considered and permitted as new with all the requirements that come with that. That is a great question or a great point, Stephanie, and something that I know um, I've heard from local jurisdictions, Nicole has heard in public meetings and, and from folks who work at local jurisdictions. Um, I think it's fair to say that it's really challenging, especially given you know, we've, we have all these regulations in place, given our current understanding of habitat and processes, and we're trying to protect things, but also be conscious of the fact that people want to and need to protect their property. We don't want, for example, septic systems falling into Puget Sound because um, they're located very close to the shoreline. And so this is admittedly a challenge that we're all dealing with. And so I guess I'll give a brief spoiler alert of what we're talking about in webinar four. Um, Nicole and myself and Ian Miller, who uh, works for Washington Sea Grant, we are working on a white paper talking about different response options on developed shorelines. So protection, accommodation, and retreat um, in response to sea level rise. And so we're gonna be talking more about that in webinar four. And so through the process of researching that, we uncovered a lot and we also uncovered a lot of questions that still remain to be answered. So hopefully you'll come back or, or continue to push this issue because collectively we, the shoreline management community are gonna to have to face this fact. And I'm gonna put in a plug for uh, creating uh, considerations for restoration given sea level rise. And that report is on the Coastal Hazards Resilience Network. And that information should be available. We're, as I think in the chat we noted, we, we sent, gave a link to the website, but the website is transitioning. So we may have trouble initially getting to that information, but the, uh, we are posting a wealth of information and one of the pieces of information is about how to what some of the different things that one should be considering in restoration projects and that applies to bulkhead removal projects. Great, thanks Nicole. Another comment from Bridget, uh, Commerce is seeking input on the inclusion of climate change in the GMA and then I think just now um, Bridget dropped a link to that um, about commerce, GMA, and climate change inclusion. So folks, if you're interested in that, please check out that link and thank you to Bridget for bringing that to our attention. And then let's get to the last two questions that I saw. So from Jill Cooper, while we are waiting for the Corps' new nearshore programmatic, um, do you think an alternatives analysis will continue to be required for bulkhead projects? If so, will we need to look not only at the coastal processes, toe of bluff geology, but also bluff geology and erosion? I'm, I'm guessing that's a question for Corey. Um, Jill, I don't know if you're still on the line. 
um, if you mean an alternatives analysis um, for core permits or for ecology and HPA. Um, I'll, I'll mention ecology just because um, I don't know if this is answering your question or not, but yes, ecology is always still going to require that alternatives analysis um, for bulkhead projects. So um, looking at um, passive techniques, soft shore, and then finally um, hard shoreline stabilization. And we're going to talk more about that in webinars two and three. Corey, I don't know if you have anything else to add to this comment or if you know anything specifically about the core process. I admit I am not um, familiar enough with them to be able to answer the question. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be pretty brief, uh, just because for the most part, the, the rulemaking is still under development, um, and I'm not necessarily in on that process, but um, I'll, I'll say from the fish and wildlife perspective, we would continue to want to see some alternatives analysis, um, and absolutely, the, the uh, justification for whatever... Um, whatever protection or armoring is being proposed absolutely needs to look at the coastal processes and the, I'd, I'd argue the entire bluff geology, if not just the toe, um, but the, the, the history of bluff geology and erosion and even, you know, upland processes that could be driving the, the, the issue regardless of the, uh, the bluff or the uh, coastal process. Um, again, like, like uh, Sydney said, we'll be talking about this a little bit more, I believe it's in the next webinar. Um, and even a little bit in the third webinar. But uh, yeah, the, those things absolutely need to be accounted for and should, really should be the driver of, of what's getting put in place. Um, you know, it's, it's the, one of the common issues that we deal with is seeing um, shore armor being, being proposed when it's an upland issue or even a deep underlying issue uh, that has little to do with the coastal process. So I'll leave that there. Great, thanks, Corey. And I guess we will uh, wrap up with a final comment from Stephanie. So the programmatic, that new programmatic we've been talking about is addressing ESA consultation. So especially um, it's NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service consultation. That's a great point of clarification. And um, Stephanie's saying that that wouldn't alter the requirement for an alternatives analysis that would be required for a core individual permit in the event that it, uh, the project doesn't meet the nationwide uh, permit criteria. It's a great clarification. Um, and so with that, we are basically at time. I wanna thank everybody for joining us and also reminding you to please, if you can join us next week for webinar two. If you're not registered already, you can find um, the registration links at coastalplanners.org slash webinars. And that's also where we will be posting the recordings and the PowerPoints and where you can also find um, our downloadable resources and our list of links, which we might be adding to given all the really awesome input from everybody who's participating. So again, thank you so much. We're really excited. We had over 100 people. That's amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and if there's nothing else from Corey and Nicole, I'll go ahead and say, see you all next week. <laughs>